So our first um, course, our first talk is going to be a crash course on quantum computing that's going to sort of bring us uh, up to speed uh, on the background that we, uh, that we need for, uh, for the school. And for that, we're very, very happy to have Henry Yuen uh, from Columbia University. Um, take it away, Henry. All right, uh, thanks Vika. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, so uh, thanks a lot for, um, uh, you know, for inviting me to, to give this uh, lecture and, and thank you very much for, uh, to everyone for, for attending this. It's great to see uh, so many people excited about um, learning quantum and, and quantum cryptography. Um, so let me uh, share my iPad screen here. Okay, so, um, so let's start with the, the first hour. So, so here we're going to uh, get into the fundamentals of quantum information. Um, and uh, I'm going to start from the very basics. Uh, and through the next uh, hour and the next uh, three hours, uh, we're going to learn uh, what we'll need for, for the rest of this uh, winter school. Um, so we're going to cover a lot, uh, but uh, you know I've tried to be selective about uh, what basics and what fundamentals we'll, we'll need for the course. Um, uh, but you know uh, if there are questions, uh, again, yeah, just ask in the, the Slack, and, and uh, I guess one of the uh, the the student moderators will will uh, bring up questions. Okay, so we're going to start with the basic postulates of quantum mechanics and Dirac notation. Um, so here's a starting point. So quantum information theory, um, you know, it can sound very scary, but uh, really the way to start thinking about it is that it's a generalization of classical probability theory where the probabilities can be negative or even complex numbers. All right, so, so let's start with some setup. Uh, let's say that you have some physical system S, uh, you know, denoted by this blue box here. Uh, and it has, you know, this system S can be in one of D distinguishable states. And let's label the states zero through D minus one. And uh, what I mean by distinguishable is that if I walked up to you with this uh, system S and you looked at what state it is, you can 100%, you know, deterministically and confidently know what state it, it's in, which one of those D states uh, it's in, okay? So that's the physical system. And let's say that there's some uh, observer E that's uh, external to the system. So how does this observer model this physical system S? Uh, well, um, well be, actually be, before I say that, let, you know, so we have the setup and there's two different things that can occur. Um, to this system S. So one thing is called measurement. So this ex external observer can go to the box and measure the state uh, to find out what state it's in. Um, there's also uh, isolated evolution. So here the external observer does not interact with the system S um, and the, the system S can change. You know, maybe it follows some laws of physics um, and it you know, evolves uh, under its, uh, on its own. So those are the two things that can happen. All right, so let's start with classical physics just to get our intuitions uh, set up. Um, at the beginning of the day, uh, the observer E, this external observer is going to assign a state to the system S, okay? And in classical physics, the way states are modeled, um, we can model it using a probability distribution over the D possible states. And we can represent it as a, a column vector. So this state S, this column vector S um, has D uh, non-negative uh, components um, uh, and uh, these numbers uh, sum up to one, their probabilities, okay? And this represents the belief that, uh, that this observer has about what probability, you know, what is the probability of, uh, you know, this system S being in state S sub I, in state I, for example. So if the observer measures the system S, then the observer is going to get a measurement outcome, uh, you know, zero through D minus one with some probability, you know, um, uh, that depends on the outcome. And once that happens, then the state uh, of the system gets updated to some S prime uh, and it gets updated to this elementary uh, vector where, you know, if the outcome of this measurement is state I, 
then uh, the, the new state is, you know, this vector was zero everywhere except one in the ith position. And now if the observer measures again, of course, you know, if nothing has changed, uh, you know, if the system hasn't evolved since then, then the state will still continue to be I with probability one. Okay, on the other hand, if the system S undergoes isolated evolution, right, it, it sort of evolves on its own, um, then the way the state gets updated is via multiplication by a matrix. So if the state was this vector S, then uh, we can find out the new state by multiplying this vector S with a matrix A. Um, and uh, this matrix A has to satisfy, you know, it can't be any matrix. Um, it's a D by D matrix that has to be stochastic, uh, meaning that all the entries of this matrix A are non-negative and each of the columns sum to one. And the reason that we need these constraints uh, is that because once you multiply this state vector with this matrix, you have to get a new state vector, which means it has to be a valid probability distribution. Okay. And stochastic matrices are, are exactly the types of matrices that map probability distributions to probability distributions. Okay, so that's all classical physics. Um, but now we can start to talk about uh, the quantum analog. So again, in the beginning of the day, the observer E is going to assign a state to the system S, but instead of being a probability distribution, uh, the state of the system is going to be a complex unit vector in C to the D, okay? A D dimensional complex vector, uh, and it's, uh, it's a unit vector. So we represent quantum states using this, this notation ket psi. And I'll say a little more about this notation uh, in a moment, but basically whenever you see this, this bracket symbol, represents a, a, a column vector. Um, and all of the entries of this column vector are going to be complex numbers. Uh, we call these complex numbers amplitudes rather than probabilities. Um, they behave a lot like, uh, you know, in some ways like probabilities, but they're, they're quite different. The constraint on these amplitudes is that if you take the norm of each of these complex numbers uh, and you square them and you add them up, you're going to get one. All right, so, so that's what it means to, to be a, a, a unit vector. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a general quantum state uh, of this system is going to be this unit vector, uh, but we can also represent classical states uh, uh, as well. And these classical states, these original D distinguishable states that we talked about um, are represented by these very nice basis vectors um, so we call them ket zero, ket one up to ket d minus one. Okay, and uh, each of these uh, basis vectors are, are the elementary, you know, basis vectors where uh, you have just one in one location and zeros everywhere else. Um, these form an orthogonal basis, um, and uh, and they represent, you know, the original classical states. Um, a general quantum state is not going, you know, not necessarily one of these classical states, but it can be a superposition of these classical basis states. So uh, any quantum state psi can be written as a linear combination of these classical basis states with these, these coefficients, alpha i's, you know, these amplitudes. Um, and, you know, again, uh, you know, at, at a first pass, you can think of these amplitudes as, as representing, you know, kind of like uh, it, it's some sort of weird probability of this of the system being in state, you know, uh, uh, zero up to d minus one. But really, again, it, it's quite different, and, and we'll start to see how amplitudes are different from probabilities. Okay, so so now let me get a little deeper into this Dirac notation because um, it, it's uh, really useful in, in quantum information theory. Um, and so this notation is named after, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dirac, who's a, you know, this famous quantum physicist. Um, and like I said, whenever you see this bracket symbol, uh, it's a column vector, okay? We call it a ket vector. Um, and if, if, this, if the bracket goes this way and it, it's a column vector, we can also take its uh, dual or Hermitian conjugate 
you know, we can cons consider the row vector version of this. So if we invert the, the bracket symbol, we, uh, we get something we call the bra vector, okay? So this is called bra psi. And when you, when you take its Hermitian conjugate, um, not only do you turn it into, you know, you, you just sort of turn it over sideways and you get a, a row vector, but you also have to take the complex conjugate of its entries. So just to give a, a concrete example, so let's say that, uh, you know, we had a, a, a column vector ket psi that was uh, say, um, let's say, let's start it off with real entries for now. So this is, um, ket psi is just uh, this classical basis vector. Then bra psi is, is just going to be uh, the row vector version of it. Um, but let's see an example where we have to take this complex conjugate. So let's say we had, I don't know, um, I and, you know, uh, you know, square root three minus I five. Now just making up some numbers. So that's the column vector. Now, when we take its complex conjugate, uh, the I turns into a minus I. So this becomes minus I comma square root three plus I five, right? So, so that's uh, just to remind you what a complex conjugate is. Um, and whenever we take the, the, the dual or the Hermitian conjugate, uh, you know, we, we consider the bra version of, of these vectors, uh, you have to remember to take these, uh, uh, these, these conjugates. Okay, so okay. let's continue on. <clears throat> um, okay, so now that we have column vectors and, and, and row vectors, we can combine them together um, and we can consider inner products. So let's say you had um, a column vector psi. It's a linear combination of uh, the zero and uh, one vectors. So, um, so these are the same thing. Um, and we had a, a row vector theta that has these, uh, these uh, you know, gamma and delta amplitudes. Uh, we can take their inner products. So if we put the, the delta and, and psi together, well, we're, we're taking the, the dual of, uh, sorry, we're, so we're, we're putting in the um, uh, bra theta, which is gamma z bra zero plus delta bra one. Uh, and then we put in uh, ket psi. So we have alpha ket zero plus beta ket one. And uh, you can just distribute. So this becomes gamma alpha And you take the inner product between the zero state and the, uh, the zero vector and the zero vector. Um, and you just take all the possible combinations. So we also have gamma, beta, bra zero, ket one, plus delta, alpha, bra one, ket zero, plus delta, beta, bra one, ket one. Okay. so. Two of these terms are going to disappear. Why is that? Well, the inner product between uh, the zero and one vectors is going to be zero because they're orthogonal vectors. So, so these go to zero. And what we're left with, <clears throat> and the inner product between the zero and zero vector is going to be one because they're, they're unit vectors. So we're left with uh, gamma alpha plus delta beta. Right. So, so that's how we, we take inner products. It's, it's just like you know, the inner products that you're used to from, from normal linear algebra. Um, but I'm just writing out here to, so you can see how we put the bras and cats together. <clears throat> and uh, this notation, this Dirac notation is, is really useful um, because you know, these angle brackets allow you to quickly identify uh, when things are a vector, which things are uh, you know, column vectors, which things are row vectors, which things are numbers, um, which things are matrices. Um, and so, so, for example, whenever you see these two angle bracket, brackets that are closed onto each other, then you know that you've identified a number, for example. Uh, and another thing is that <clears throat> these, um, uh, the, the, the choice of naming this bra and ket, uh, uh, you know, when you put them together, it, it you know, means bracket. So, so that's where uh, the name comes from. Okay, so, so that's how you take uh, inner products. Um,
there's just one more thing about um, uh, this direct notation that I wanted to talk about because we'll use it later, uh, which is uh, talking about outer products. So we just talked about inner products. This is when you put a row vector followed by a column vector. The outer product is where we, we uh, switch things around. So let's say we have <clears throat> two vectors. Uh, we have ket psi and bra zero. So this is a column vector, this is a row vector. And if you remember from uh, you know, your linear algebra uh, course, uh, this means you have a, a matrix, right? So, so let's just say that we have um, ket, uh, ket psi. Uh, and let's, let's say that it's a, it's a two-dimensional system. So it's this linear combination alpha ket zero plus beta ket one. And let's give, uh, let's say that ket theta is equal to gamma zero plus delta one. All right, so let's write out what this, um, uh, what this corresponding outer product would be. So I also have alpha beta gamma delta. So this outer product is the same as well, we put down the, the, the column vector corresponding to psi, and then we put down the, uh, the row vector, the, the dual vector corresponding to theta. Okay, and when you take the outer product, you get this two by two matrix. Uh, and uh, uh, we can do the multiplication. So this becomes alpha times gamma star, which is the complex conjugate of gamma beta delta star, okay? So we get that two by two matrix. <clears throat> There's another way to see it, uh, which is if we, you know, just stuck with this, um, this uh, bra ket notation. So here's another way to write it. So I'm gonna put this, these bras and kets. So we have delta star times bra zero plus uh, delta star times <clears throat> bra one. And if you expand, then you'll get again, four combinations that correspond to the matrix entries of, of the two by two matrix we just calculated. Okay, so so these are so these look somewhat different, but really they're the same thing. Okay, um, and uh, essentially these uh, these uh, matrices, these outer products, correspond to uh, matrices where that just have one in one part of the matrix and zeros everywhere else. Okay, um, so so that's an outer product, uh, and it, you know. It, as we move on through this course, we'll, we'll uh, you know, this, this outer product notation will be useful because we can quickly do matrix vector multiplication. So, so let's say we had a matrix M that was this outer product and we multiplied it by uh, this vector phi. All right, so matrix times a vector is another vector and uh, this direct notation makes it very apparent that this is the case. So if we just write down each of these these things, then this theta and this phi come together to form an inner product, right? And whenever we see an inner product, that's a number. And we're left with the number times a vector, which is, which is just a, a, you know, a vector. Okay, <clears throat> um, good. And, and finally, uh, like we already said before, every matrix can be written as uh, an, a sum of outer products uh, like this, right? If, if it has matrix entries uh, mij, then, then you just put them together and, and that's, that's the same as the, the original matrix. 
Okay, so, so that's the direct notation. Um, and you know, if you need to refer back to this, you can find the slides on, on the website and uh, you can just, uh, if you need to remind yourself what these things are. All right, so let's get back to the, the quantum physics. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, you know, we have this observer and we have this physical system and there's two things that can happen to this physical system. Um, measurement can occur uh, or isolated evolution can occur. So if the state is measured, then uh, if the system is measured, um, then this observer is going to get a measurement outcome I with probability that's the norm squared of alpha I squared. So alpha I was the amplitude of state I. And, and then the state of the system gets uh, collapsed from the original state psi to the classical state ket I, okay? So it's, it was sort of like in the, the classical case. So it, it went from this uh, this column vector with all these, uh, you know, uh, many, many amplitudes, and then it gets updated to the one with all zeros except for one in the ith component. Okay, and if the observer measures again, uh, then it's still going to get state i with probability one. Okay, uh, and this is called the Born rule, and really this refers specifically to the fact that the probability is going to be uh, the norm squared of, of this amplitude. Okay, so uh, let's just see uh, like a, a, a geometric visualization of what's going on. So uh, let's say we had um, we have a, a, a qubit. So a qubit is the simplest quantum system. It's a two dimensional quantum system, the quantum version of a bit. Um, and let's say our qubit is in the following state. Uh, it has uh, amplitude square root two thirds for the state zero and, and square root one thirds for the state one. Uh, you can draw it as uh, this red vector here. Uh, and if you measure this qubit, um, it's going to collapse into uh, one of two states with, with uh, the following probabilities. It's going to collapse in the state zero with probability uh, norm alpha squared, which is two thirds, uh, or it's going to collapse into the state one uh, with probability one thirds. Okay. <clears throat> so, so that's a basic measurement. Uh, what's the other thing, this isolated evolution? So um, the way that the state of the system gets updated, uh, it's not multiplication, it's multiplication by matrix, but uh, a different kind of matrix. This time it's called a unitary matrix. Um, so uh, what's a unitary matrix? Well, it's one where, uh, first of all, the matrix has to be invertible. So it has an inverse uh, and it's, it's inverse happens to be equal to its Hermitian conjugate. So uh, it's, this is where, you know, if you write U dagger, this is where you have to take the transpose of the matrix and then take the complex conjugate of every entry, right? So uh, as an example, uh, you know, if you have a, a matrix like, uh, you know, what's called the, the X matrix, which will show up again. So it's a, a two by two matrix that looks like this. Um, this is a, a unitary matrix. Uh, why is that? Well, if we take its, uh, you know, its, its Hermitian conjugate, well, actually nothing changes. We take its transpose and we take its, uh, you know, complex conjugate, all the entries, it's still the same matrix. Uh, and if you multiply X, you know, uh, X times X, you get X transpose, you get the identity, right? Which tells you that, that X is, is uh, unitary. Uh, an, another example is something called the Y matrix. So th it looks like this, or actually, um, so it, you know, this has complex entries in it. Uh, it also turns out that Y transpose is equal to itself. Um, and and uh, it's, it's also equal to its uh, inverse. So, so this is unitary. All right, so um, there's a couple equivalent definitions of uh, a unitary matrix that we need to keep in mind. Um, and um, so one is the one I just told you, a unitary matrix is one where it's inverse is its Hermitian conjugate. Um, uh, but these other definitions are, are uh, also very useful. So um, it's, this is equivalent to uh, the fact that as a matrix, um, 
it maps unit vectors to unit vectors. Okay, and, and this is important because when you apply a unitary matrix to a quantum state, which is unit vector, you want to get a new quantum state out, and that also has to be a unit vector. Um, so, so these are equivalent. Um, and it also means that uh, this matrix preserves the inner products between uh, vectors. So let's say you had two vectors, psi and phi. And uh, let's say that they have some uh, particular inner product. You know, maybe it's one, maybe it's somewhere in between zero and one, maybe, maybe it's something else. Um, well, that is the same as the inner product between psi star and phi star, where, uh, or yeah, psi prime is equal to the unitary applied to psi and phi prime is equal to the unitary applied to phi. All right. <clears throat> um, and you know, the way to see that is if we just plug in what these vectors mean, well, we get uh, psi. And then when we, whenever we take the, uh, you know, the, the transpose of, of this, we have to take the transpose of the matrix U. And, you know, by definition of the matrix being unitary, this is just the identity. So, so here we get the, the same inner product. All right, so, so you know, it's good to keep in mind that these, these are all equivalent definitions of what it means to be unitary. All right, um, let's look at some quick examples. Um, let's say that our system, our qubit, starts in the state ket1, right? So it's, it's this unit vector. Um, and we wanna apply the, uh, this following unitary, which I, I explained uh, is, is a unitary matrix. Uh, we call this the bit flip gate. Um, and you know, the reasons for this should become apparent soon. Um, if we take X times this, this vector psi, well, if we do the matrix vector multiplication, one way of doing it is just to write out what these, uh, what these matrices and vectors are. Well, you see that you get the following vector, which is just the zero state. So it flips the one state to the zero state. And it also does the, the opposite. So, uh, so afterwards, we, after we apply this, uh, this unitary, we get uh, this following state. So it gets rotated uh, to the zero state. Um, on the other hand, if you start with the zero state instead and you apply the X unitary, you get the one state. So it flips back and forth between the zero and one. It's just a, you know, it looks like a classical bit flip operator. All right, let's uh, look at another example. And, and here I'm also sort of sneaking in uh, a bunch of unitaries that we'll, we'll need over this course. Um, uh, so this is uh, the, something called the Hadamard unitary. It's a little more complicated. Um, this is a unitary matrix. And if you, you know, calculate what happens, uh, well, you're going to get not a classical state, but uh, a, a superposition uh, of classical states. So you're going to get, um, if you do the math correctly, then this should be one over square root two minus one over square root two. So you get this state which looks like, you know, if you draw it as a vector, it's somewhere over here. All right. Um, and we call this a, a superposition because uh, it's, a, you know, the state is in some sense in the zero and one state at the same time with these, you know, so the, these negative uh, amplitudes. Okay. Uh, and this matrix, like I said, is, it's called the Hadamard gate. All right, so uh, in the interest of time, I, uh, you know, I'll skip more of these examples. You, you know, I encourage you to try to do these on your own and see what happens. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, measurements uh, in, in different bases now. So, so I talked about measurements and um, that was measurements in, in what's called the standard basis. So by default, if I say, you know, let's measure a, a quantum system or measure a qubit, um, 
then we generally assume that we're talking about measuring according to the standard basis. Um, but we can also measure uh, according to an arbitrary basis. So uh, if we have some, uh, some quantum state, uh, d-dimensional quantum state, uh, and we also walk up with some uh, orthonormal basis, um, b0 up to bd minus one. So these are going to be ortho orthonormal basis vectors. Then, you know, there's some rules about uh, how do we, uh, how we measure according to that. So if you measure according to this basis, you're going to get one of the basis uh, vectors with probability that is equal to the inner product between your original state and the basis vector, and then you take its norm squared, right? So this is kind of intuitive. You kind of look at like how much is the overlap between your state and the basis vector, uh, and then you, you take its magnitude squared. Uh, that's going to be the probability. And then afterwards, the state gets collapsed to your basis state uh, bi, right? So it's just like uh, you know measurements that we had before, except you you can you sort of redefine what your your basis is. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, let's quickly do this example. So um, so here we have this qubit psi. So it's a red vector. Um, it has these these amplitudes, and I want to measure not with uh, the standard basis, but what's called the diagonal basis. The diagonal basis is formed by these two vectors. We call them the ket plus and ket minus states. The plus state is the you know, zero plus one over root two, and the minus state is zero minus one over root two. Um, and so let's, you know, let's see what the probability uh, of, let's say, obtaining the outcome plus if we measure in the diagonal basis. Well, uh, we just have to calculate what this inner product is. So if we write it down, so let me write down what psi, the, the row vector psi is. So we have uh, minus two thirds bra zero plus uh, square root uh, one over three bra one. And then one over root two. <clears throat> right, and then you just, you know, compute the inner products like the, the way that we saw. So we have that this is minus square root one thirds plus square root one over six. And then we just have to, you know, take the norm squared. Right, and then this, this is just going to be some number, but that's the probability. All right, so, and then afterwards it gets updated to the plus state, right? And you can do the same thing for the minus state uh, you get some other probability, which is just going to be one minus this, uh, this probability we just calculated, right? So probability is going to be equal to one minus because right? there's only two possible outcomes. Okay, <clears throat> so, so now you know, uh, you know, most of the fundamental um, uh, postulates about how we model quantum states. Um, and so in this next section, I'm going to try to give some intuition for, you know, what, you know, what are the differences between uh, quantum bits and classical bits, right? So one question that you might have is that, um, you know, these amplitudes, what do they really mean, right? Like they can be complex numbers or they can be negative numbers. Um, like, you know, does it actually matter that we allow these, uh, you know, these amplitudes to be negative or, or complex? Okay, so, so let's take these two states that we saw, that these two states that form the diagonal basis, the plus state and the minus state. Um, so these are the, you know, the, the two states. What happens when we measure them, right? Um, whether we measure the plus or, or the minus state in the standard basis. So, um, you know, from the rules that we saw, uh, the outcomes are exactly the same, right? So if we measure the plus state, we're going to get ket zero, ket one with uh, one half probability, but that's also the case with uh, the minus state. So the measurement outcomes are, are the same. So 
So even though in the minus state, there was a, a minus sign in, in one of the, the amplitudes, it didn't seem to make a difference, uh, right? So, so measurement seems to destroy, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, minus signs. So, so what's the point? Why, why are they useful? Well, it's because we also have this other thing, which is unitary evolution, but uh, let me get to that in a second. One thing to notice is that these two states, uh, plus and minus, are, are orthogonal to each other, right? Um, and you know you can sort of see this for yourself, right? If you you calculate their inner product, it's going to be uh, zero. Um, and whenever you have orthogonal states in quantum mechanics, it means that they're perfectly distinguishable from another, right? Um, and it's not by just immediately measuring them; you have to do apply unitary operation first. <clears throat> right, so let's say someone you know handed you a state that was either the plus or minus state, but they didn't tell you which. How can you tell the difference between the two? Well, uh, you're going to have to apply a, a unitary operation first, and in this case, you should apply the, the Hadamard matrix, which we saw. Okay, and uh, yet another way of thinking about what unitaries do is that they map they their change of basis operations. Right, um, they'll map one basis to another. And this Hadamard, uh, uh, this Hadamard gate will map the diagonal basis to the standard basis. So, so if you, you know, calculate out what H applied to the plus state is, uh, you know, let, let, let me just write that out really quick. So you see an, uh, an example. Well, H is a matrix, so you can, it's, you know, it's a linear operation, you can bring it in. Uh, you can, you know, apply it to the zero vector and then the one vector and add them up. Uh, and what you get is you'll get that this is the zero vector. Okay, and similarly, if you uh, calculate H applied to the minus vector, you get one. All right, and now after you've done this change of basis, you can now measure and in the standard basis and know exactly uh, which one of the original vectors it, it was. Okay, so, so the takeaway is that, you know, minus signs in the amplitudes matter. Um, you know, we had this minus sign in, uh, uh, in the minus state, and this, this was useful because it, it, you know, it got mapped, it, it made the state get mapped to the one state via this Hadamard gate, rather than the zero state. Okay, and <clears throat> these are called relative phases. Um, uh, basically, these are uh, complex phases or, or minus signs that exist between the, the zero and one states or you know, the, the different pieces of your superposition. Um, these relative phases are very, very important for um, in, in quantum information because they can make uh, states uh, be orthogonal to each other that way. Um, on the other hand, something called global phases don't matter. Uh, what that means is um, if you have a state psi and you just throw a minus sign in front of the whole state, then there's they're essentially the same state. I mean, as mathematically as vectors, one's the minus of the other, but there's no measurement and no unitary that can tell the difference that you can apply to tell the difference between the two, right? Um, and, and so uh, just having a global phase doesn't affect the, the, uh, the state of the system. Okay, so, so that's one, uh, one difference. Um, you know, minus signs do matter because you can apply these unitary transformations and, and, and then measure. In a, uh, in a, and then measure. Um, here's another thing. Uh, this is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And, and this will actually come up in uh, Rotem's lecture um, when she talks about quantum key distribution. Um, so, you know, probably many of you have heard about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, a popular science version of it is that you cannot simultaneously know the position and velocity of a particle, All right? Well, so what, what does that even mean? Um, uh, well, precisely, I mean, there's many, many different versions of this uncertainty principle, but essentially they all boil down to measurements of a quantum state uh, with respect to different bases. Uh, in, in particular, they talk about measurements with respect to incompatible bases. 
Okay, so, so what does incompatible mean? Well, if you have two orthonormal bases for, uh, for you know, the space, they're compatible if they're really the same up to permutations and global phases, right? So like if you, you know, switch around which basis vectors you have and maybe you multiply it by minus signs or you know, uh, roots of unity, um, that's not really going to fundamentally change what basis you're talking about, right? The, all the bases are kind of aligned with each other. Uh, but otherwise, uh, they're going to be incompatible. So if we take the standard basis, the zero one basis, or this diagonal basis, um, these are incompatible, right? If you draw them out, these bases are at you know, 45 degree angles with each other. <clears throat> um, okay, so, so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for qubits in the simplest possible version of the statement, it says that uh, if, if you take a qubit state, um, this vector, it cannot be simultaneously determined in two incompatible bases. And by determined, I mean, if you measure with respect to one basis that you get an outcome with say probability one, uh, then if you take the, the other basis, which is incompatible, you cannot get a probability one outcome. There's going to be some uncertainty about which uh, uh, outcome you get, right? Um, and, you know, it's, if you just sort of draw this out geometrically, this is kind of obvious, right? Like if we have, uh, you know, the standard basis here, cat zero, cat one, and we have the uh, diagonal basis here, cat plus and cat minus, uh, let's say we had, uh, you know, uh, some, some quantum state, let me call it blue, that was determined in the standard basis. Well, if you measure that, that blue vector with respect to the diagonal basis, you're going to get the plus or minus state with half probability, right? Um, and you can sort of see no matter where you draw this blue vector with, at least, with respect to at least one of these bases, you're going to get um, some amount of uh, uncertainty. Um, and there's, you know, you can make this more quantitative um, and actually I'll, I'll, you know, I'll sort of skip uh, past this here because uh, actually Rotem is going to give a sort of a, a, a quantitative version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that will be useful for quantum key distribution. Um, but you can sort of measure basically uh, uh, give a quantitative lower bound on, on the minimum amount of uncertainty that you must have when you measure with respect to, to different bases. Okay, so, so the uncertainty principle is you know, certainly a unique feature to, uh, to quantum. It doesn't occur in classical. Um, here's another you know, unique quantum feature, which is called the quantum Zeno effect. And this is really um, uh, a quantum version of the, this idiom that if you watch a, a pot that's on the stove, it's, it's never gonna boil. Um, I don't think this is actually true, but uh, this is apparently what people say. Um, the moral of this quantum Zeno effect is that um, if you have a, a quantum experiment where you have you know, unitaries of acting on a state and then you measure, whether or not you have intermediate measurements in this experiment, it can drastically change the outcome uh, of the experiment. So consider the following. Let's say you had a qubit uh, that uh, starts in the zero state, okay? Um, and then we're going to do the following for, um, you know, pi over two theta times. Think of theta as being a, a small number. <clears throat> we're going to apply the following unitary. We're going to apply this R theta unitary to the qubit. You know, just keep on applying it, you know, multiple, you know, ap apply this unitary over and over again. And after we're done, we're going to uh, measure the qubit in the standard basis. Right. So in this experiment A, we sort of consider this as the pot being left alone. Um, the qubit is the pot, and the stove is going to be applying this unitary over and over again to this qubit. Well, let's consider experiment B, and this is sort of the watched pot situation. Um, everything's the same. We're going to start the uh, qubit in the zero state, uh, and then we're going to apply the same unitary R theta. Um, but after we apply the unitary once, we're going to measure it, 
right? Before applying the unitary again. So this, this, is, a, this is an intermediate measurement. <clears throat> okay, so we're just gonna measure, apply unitary, measure, apply unitary. Um, and I claim that the results of these two experiments are gonna be very, very different. All right, and, and so let me quickly uh, you know, analyze this. Well, if you look at this unitary, um, well, first, you know, our, our state starts off in, in, in the zero state. So this is our qubit psi. And if we apply this unitary r theta, you know, you work out the math, it, it really, it just rotates this, uh, this vector counterclockwise by an angle theta. Right, so after you apply r theta, our state vector gets, uh, gets updated to, to this following state vector, okay? Um, and since in this experiment A, we're just continuing to apply this rotation matrix, this uh, vector will continue slowly uh, rotating. And after K times, by the way, we've chosen K, it's going to be, be very, very close to Uh, to the one state, okay? And when we measure with very, very high probability, uh, this state is going to uh, collapse into the state one. So uh, you can sort of work out how close it is to the state one, but it's going to be very close. So when you measure, you get one with high probability. Okay, so this is the, the pot being left alone. It's going to sort of heat up. It's going to move to the one state. All right, well, but what about experiment B? <clears throat> so, um, so after we apply the, uh, you know, the unitary once, you know, it starts off in the zero state and then we get uh, cosine theta ket zero plus sine theta ket one. Uh, and then you measure this qubit in the standard basis. You're going to get, well, you're gonna get a probabilistic outcome. You're going to get ket zero with probability cosine squared theta and get uh, one with probability sine squared theta, okay. But if we're thinking of theta as being very, very small, sine squared theta is also very, very small. So this is, this is equal to theta squared, all right? <clears throat> so, uh, you know, let's imagine that we measure and then we get the zero state out, then we're sort of back in the beginning, right? Uh, and then if we apply the, uh, you know, the, the unitary r theta again, then, you know, we measure it, we're, it's going to be the same, it's the same outcome. Uh, and so if we sort of add up, what's the probability of the state moving to anything other than the zero state at the very end? or put it another way, you know, what is the probability that in this experiment B, we ever measure the one outcome? Right, so by a union bound, this is at most K times theta squared, right? But if we plug in K, this is O of uh, one over theta times theta squared, this is O of theta, right? Um, and since theta can be arbitrarily small, this probability of ever measuring one can be arbitrarily small. So, so the moral is in this experiment B, instead of getting one with high probability, we get zero with high probability. Okay, so these intermediate measurements will really change the course of, uh, of the state. Um, and you know, just to contrast this with, with the uh, classical systems, inter intermediate measurements don't make a difference at all in the statistical outcomes in, 
uh, in, in you know, any experiment that you run. Okay. All right, so that's the quantum Zeno effect. Um, all right, let's move to uh, the last part of this, uh, this uh, our lecture, which is composite quantum systems. Um, so far, we've just been talking about you know, a single qubit or you know, a general d-dimensional system. But really the power of quantum information comes when we start combining uh, quantum systems together, right? We put qubits together or we put uh, you know, uh, you know, a bunch of quantum systems together. Um, and this requires us, in order to talk about this, we need to talk about tensor products. All right, so the, the state of a, a qubit, you know, we, we've seen it's, it's described by a unit vector in two-dimensional complex space. Um, this is called the Hilbert space of the qubit. Um, you know, let's not worry so much about what a Hilbert space is. It's, it's just think of it as C to the D. Um, but let's say we have two qubits. How do we describe them? Well, we, we can describe them uh, using uh, tensor products. So the Hilbert space of, of two qubits is going to be C2, tensor C2. This is a new vector space. Um, and it's spanned by uh, um, you know, uh, four basis vectors that are the tensor products of the you know, qubit basis vectors. So we have zero tensor zero. This is going to be a four dimensional vector that uh, column vector that looks like, you know, has one in the first position and zero everywhere else. Uh, and then we have these three other basis vectors. Uh, they're going to be, uh, they're all orthonormal to each other as you can see. Um, and, and these span this, this new tensor product space, right? You can think of it as this basis as representing the classical states of the two qubits and you can take superpositions or linear combinations of them. And uh, this is very important, but um, you know, it's easy to get confused. Uh, we're going to use the following shorthand so we can represent these tensor products of vectors um, uh, in several different ways. So uh, you know, here we've written them as you know, I tensor J, but just to save space, we'll oftentimes omit the tensor product symbol or maybe we'll just put them in the same uh, bracket and we might even you know, omit the comma, right? So uh, sometimes it can get confusing, but really all of these refer to the same thing. All right, so uh, for example, zero one is just the same as zero tensor one. Okay. So that's the, that's the tensor product space. That's the Hilbert space. Now, let's say we have two qubits um, and individually they're described by uh, the states ket psi and ket phi. How do we describe the, the two qubits jointly? Well, we take their tensor product, right? Um, and uh, let's, we can sort of write out what this tensor product is in terms of the, the basis states of the tensor product space. And the tensor product, you know, behaves a lot like, uh, you know, maybe polynomial multiplication or something. So you can, you know, distribute the tensor product. So this is equal to uh, alpha gamma and I'll, I'll write the tensor product this, zero comma zero plus uh, alpha delta zero comma one plus beta gamma one comma zero plus beta delta one comma one, All right? So this is going, this is the, the unit vector in, uh, in, in this tensor product space, right? You can see that it's also a unit vector um, if you, you know, square all of the, the, the amplitudes and sum them up, you're going to get one. Um, so, so we can put qubits together like that, um, but a general qubit state is not necessarily of this form. A general qubit state is, is going to be some arbitrary linear combination of these basis states where the amplitudes square and sum to one. Um, 
but yeah, like I said, you know, it's not necessarily the case that such a psi in general will be equal to the tensor product of two qubit uh, of two individual qubits put together. And if if and if they cannot be written in this product form, then we say that they're entangled. Right? Um, otherwise, they are unentangled. Okay, so. Uh, so here are ex examples of entangled and unentangled states. So here's a very important two qubit state called the EPR pair. Um, and it's, you know, it's this equal superposition between the two qubits being in the state zero and the two qubits being in the state one. So you can see that these two qubits are, are correlated in, in some interesting way. Um, and you can sort of work out through the math and, and see that this state cannot be written as a tensor product of two single qubit states, right? The EPR is not equal to psi tensor phi. Uh, and you can prove this by contradiction. You say, suppose there were, um, you know, a, a psi and a phi that, that uh, satisfied this, um, uh, then, then you would, you know, derive a contradiction. Um, so, so you can, this EPR pair is, is not a product state. It is, it is entangled. Um, in this example, um, you know, if you're not used to quantum information, you see this, this long superposition, you know, there's four terms and you say, well, it looks complicated. There's like, it seems pretty quantum because it's in this, the states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, all at the same time. Um, so, you know, it looks like it, it's entangled, um, but it's not, it's, it's not unentangled. It turns out that you can write this as the plus state tensor, the plus state. You know, if you expand this out, you'll, you'll see that you get uh, these four terms like, like uh, they're above. So, so this is an unentangled state. These two qubits are behaving independently. All right. Um, so you can take, uh, you know, inner products in this tensor product space. Um, you know, so let's say that you have, you want to take the inner product between this row vector and, you know, the tensor product of these row vectors with the tensor product of these column vectors. Well, you have to match up the tensor slots together. So the A has to go with the C because it's on the left side of the tensor product symbol. And the B has to go with the D. And you get the product of these two numbers out and you get a number. And so now you have this rule for inner products for uh, in this way, you can take inner products of arbitrary two qubit states, right? So, so here, you know, we won't work it out because uh, we're close to the top of the hour, but uh, you know, if you write out what this, what this inner product is, you can, uh, you get this expression and then you can sort of expand and then use this rule to complete the rest of the calculation. All right, so, so in fact, I'll, I'll just write it here. You get um, the following. Okay, so uh, I think uh, let's maybe take a break here. Um, and we'll sort of finish up the rest of the talking about tensor products uh, before moving on to uh, quantum algorithms and, and quantum circuits. Um, Henry, there is one question. Uh -huh. um, so you mentioned the measurement in a different basis um, or, when, or you, you can apply the unitary and then measure in the standard basis, right? So uh, the question is in what, it, in what sense are they equivalent? Is it also computationally equivalent? Can you also can you always do both in practice? Yeah. So um, uh, if they're equivalent in the sense that um, you know we had, I told you how you know if I had a some basis B, uh, then there's some rules about what are the probabilities of the outcomes if I measure in that basis. Um, but uh, an equivalent way of doing it would be to, I first apply a unitary and then measure in the standard basis, uh, and then the probabilities of getting the outcomes in the standard basis will be the same as 
measuring in the uh, you know the original different basis right but that's that's a mathematical equivalence but is it also like in practice or um, oh uh, in the physical yeah. sense oh in the sort of like in the lab yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, in in the, I guess in the real world, at the end of the day, everyone just measures in the standard basis, um, and so to to do this change of basis, you apply unitary, and then. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'll check the Slack and, and and see if there are more questions, and and see you in uh, half an hour. <laughs>